everyone. It's the second week of Lent, and um, that's a season, of, as I was saying, actually, the fourth in the Christian year for reflection on our lives, for deepening our spiritual disciplines, and turning again toward God. And in the spirit of repentance and turning again toward God, the sermon series is about uh, different bad habits and ideas that Christianity has picked up over the last couple thousand years, just to have something nice and narrow in ways that we can let go and turn in a new direction and move forward. So I'm calling it Christian Mythbusters. And this week is episode two, Ladies Can Do Stuff Now. Woo! Woo-hoo! <laughs> All right. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. I'm going to sing the prayer, and if you know it, feel free to pray. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet. While I run this race, guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. So I am figuring that most of the folks in the room are, for the most part, on board with lady ministers. Since I'm standing here preaching, and they're still in your seats, right? You haven't run away. Um, in the churches that I grew up in, the pastors were mostly men, but I think that was more circumstance and the relative rarity of women in ministry, rather than because the churches we were part of were opposed to women pastors. So I don't remember anyone questioning my sense of calling to be a pastor until college when I was part of a non-denominational campus ministry. And interestingly enough, the campus pastor of that group gave me a book with four different views on women in ministry, and they were all from an evangelical perspective, and they all came to a different conclusion, which on a meta level seems like an interesting comment on the idea that um, scripture is inerrant, right? That you can only get, uh, there's like four different, they're like right in the book, there's four different versions. Um, so anyway, it seems like you shouldn't be able to come to four different conclusions about the So for me, the book didn't give me much guidance on whether or not I should be called into ministry as a woman. I already knew that was well within God's capabilities. But it did put an end to any idea that I might have that the Bible is something magically perfect, providing an, act, an exact answer to every question about my life through a simple and straightforward reading. The Bible does have its own magic and its own beauty, and it can put us in touch with the holy. But the process is frequently neither simple nor straightforward. But that is a whole other sermon. So the thing about the Bible is that it's written by people, and the people writing it were speaking from their own experience and out of their own culture, because there's no other way to write something, especially not something that requires lots of stories and interpretation and something that's about life as a whole. So parts of the culture that were maybe not so great or, you know, oppressive could get into the Bible right alongside the beautiful and the free and the human. And they wouldn't even have to ride along in the front seat all the time for some kind of blatant comment like Paul or maybe one of his imitators saying, I do not allow a woman to teach. But could write along in the back with the gospel accounts of 12 male disciples who are somehow more important to name and count than Mary and Martha of Bethany or Mary Magdalene, who seems to have been one of the people bankrolling Jesus' whole operation and who on top of it was the only one named in all the gospels as being at the side of the tomb to discover Jesus' resurrection. So sure, Jesus had women disciples, but the people who liked the meat number 12 left them out, most likely in a totally unconscious nod to the patriarchy. And at that time, we're literally talking about a patriarchy. We're talking about people in, living in large, spreading household farms with a single male patriarch at the head. And none of this, we don't have this like nuclear family where so everybody's living in their little units far from grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins. Everybody pretty much sticks around and is part of the larger family unit, except when they get married and then the women have to go to their husband's household, wherever that is, and fit into that big network instead. In any case, dad or grandpa or uncle Dave is running things and making the key decisions. So that's a matriarchy, and that's mostly how people in Jesus' day lived in households headed by a patriarch, literally. And Christianity has carried water for the patriarchy for many, many years. And even now, there are many Christians who believe that a certain set of gender roles coming out of patriarchal culture are necessarily and central 
to what it means to be Christians. Uh, wear skirts and have long hair, or don't wear skirts and have long hair, and do jobs that help people, or do jobs, do work that keeps people safe, be a man, act like a lady, and of course, don't get a relationship with someone of the same sex, because that messes everything up. If two men are married or two women, then who's the man in that relationship, right? And who's the woman? You know, it reveals a key flaw in the culture, the limits that that culture puts on human freedom and our ability to live as God created us. And God has created a wide variety of human beings. So while many of us fit into the patriarchal norms okay, or at least we can make it work, there are plenty of us for whom that is just not possible. That is not who God made us to be. So I did want to actually talk about the Bible verse at some point. In this story, Jesus is upending a different set of roles in the patriarchal culture that he's part of, that of servant and master, or servant and patriarch. The patriarch is supposed to be the one who receives the service. If his feet are dirty and dusty, the servant washes his feet. If he's hungry, the servant feeds him. As a teacher or a rabbi like a patriarch, a teacher or a rabbi is accorded the honor that's deserving, uh, is accorded honor and is deserving of servants by the people below him in the chain. So what Jesus does is very unsettling to the disciples. He puts on the clothes of a servant and he does the messy work of washing their feet, which they don't even want him to do. And this isn't symbolic washing the way we might experience it today if we did a reenactment washing someone's feet when they've been wearing socks and there's a little lint to rinse off. <laughs> you know, have you ever done those? You're like, poor, rinse, dry, fine. <laughs> These men have been walking around in sandals all day and their feet are going to be dirty. Maybe today the equivalent would be washing somebody's car after a snowstorm and there's all this road salt and random mud and like the wheel, there's like grime on the wheels. You're like, what is that? Tar? Um, except, obviously, it's much more personal because you're kneeling at someone's feet and touching their feet. Um, but you can see how much of a ta taboo Jesus is breaking because of how much the disciples don't want him to do it. Peter says, you know, you'll never, never do Jesus. And Jesus tells him, this is part of the deal. If you want to be my disciple, you have to let me wash your feet. Which is a little bit like I'm commanding you, but there you go. This is important, he says. You don't get to skip this lesson. And one way of stating that lesson is this. The patriarchy, the arbitrary elevation of one person over another is over. The new world, the kingdom of God, the eternal life that Jesus is teaching about and bringing into the world is one where each person is free and is equal. And living that out as Christians mean that our, means that our leaders are our servants and that only Jesus, the greatest servant of all, is truly so I just want to read one passage that we read over again. Jesus says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to, do, uh, done to you. In Christ we all become servants of one another, without regard for gender, for class, ethnicity, race, or any other marker. To quote a different passage from the Apostle Paul, from the one we heard before, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. If we are part of a household, it is the household of God, and Jesus, the Jesus who is about to die a humiliating death on the cross, the Jesus who was never rich, whose power was not in this world, that Jesus is the head of the household. And he has this habit of acting like a servant himself. So what's the good news here? Uh, well, first of all, ladies can do stuff now. I'm, sorry, I'm quoting my word. Anyway, that's just, that's just <laughs> the comedy nerd in me. It's a, it's funny. Okay, when the world is opened up for women to contribute our gifts, those gifts become available to everyone in a way that they weren't before. But really, this is a microcosm of the larger point which is that Jesus is freeing all people to be who they were created to be, men and women, and all the people who don't quite fit into either category, but have their own way of being in the world. Jesus is freeing us all to 
in the dehumanizing dynamic of predetermined gender roles, of the roles of servant and master, of insider and outsider. And now we can sit together at the table and in God's household, and we are all equally loved and cherished and called to serve. My prayer is that we will answer the call. In the name of Jesus, our servant and our teacher, thanks be to God. Amen. So let's have some time for reflection. Our reflection question is, where do you see Jesus living out radical equality among all people?